So why do Republicans have to suck so much? Why do they have to have no actual values or principles? This is why people are always like, you go after Republicans so much harder than Democrats. I'm like, yeah, because Democrats at least tell you what they are, right? Like they openly suck. They're not trying to disguise it. Like they're socialist commies and, and that's what they are. So I expect them to suck. Republicans are over here claiming to espouse my values, which are actually free market capitalism, actually limited government, actually individual liberty, and then doing the exact opposite. Hey guys, welcome back to The Base Brief. This week, Sam Smith worships the devil at the Grammys, AMC has a new tiered seating price, a congresswoman tries to force chocolate milk on kids, and a quick hits roundup. Let's jump in. Hey Brad, guess what degree it is here right now? I what? It's going to be 67 degrees by I, 4 I p.m. That. today. I hate you. That, how dare you? I know. i sorry. I had to rub it in a little bit, but I'm like, I have all my transitional layers for the day. I'm I'm stoked. Phoenix and I are gonna go to, we're going to go to the dog park in a little bit. It's going to be You know, I recently lovely. went 72 hours without stepping outside my home. <laughs> That's how cold it is here and how introverted I am, but literally... That would be me if I lived in Michigan, actually. I went skiing over the weekend, which was actually my first time skiing in like, I don't know, at least a decade. I used to go a lot in high school and college. I didn't really like it that much, so I haven't gone in a long time. But I went this weekend, and I actually had a great time, but I think it's because I finally had the proper gear. Like, I rented all the, like, bibs and, and that kind of things. So you don't really get that wet or cold. And turns out, I actually love skiing, and I'm pretty good at it, except for the ski lifts. Ski lifts are the most terrifying thing in the world. And I'm talking like, I was in North Carolina, so these ski lifts are not crazy. I don't know how people just go out heights? in Colorado. Yes. You're just hanging there with your I heavy like ski heights. and nothing barring you in. You could easily just topple out and they stop and they're jerky. It's horrifying. I mostly stuck to the bunny trail for that reason alone, but it's still a good time. So you're excited for the uh, State of the Union? You have any drinking games? Uh, what does he love to say? Malarkey, build back better. <laughs> I don't know. What's your Biden drinking game uh, bingo card have on it? Well, I am very excited for the State of the Union because like a true political nerd, this is my Grammys night. So I can't wait. I will be watching. Um, Two of our good friends in Atlanta are actually coming over to meet Phoenix tonight. I think they're going to watch some of it with me. But I don't play drinking games during the State of the Union because I'd get drunk and I intend to make some content around it and play in. So I I think you should make drunk content around it. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That actually might be hilarious (laughs) hilarious because <laughs> i i'm kind of an upfront person anyways but get a drink or two in me and i will tell you the god's honest truth of whatever you ask me so it could be uh flying loose if well I did that. speaking of god uh we should probably dive into our first subject which is the thing everybody's been talking about sam smith and kim petrus's famous slash infamous performance at sunday night's grammys Now, look, you've probably heard a bunch of people talk about this, but Hannah and I are going to have, I think, a different perspective and a few different angles you might not have heard. Um, But first, just for folks uh, who haven't caught up on this story. So Sam Smith and Kim Petras have a uh, really popular song right now called Unholy, uh, and they performed it at the Grammys. And Sam Smith was dressed as the devil, uh, and Kim Petras was uh, performed in a cage surrounded by flames, while she was flanked by drag stars uh, who were dressed as dominatrixes with devil horns. The whole performance was very sexualized. It was very clearly like, I think, kind of cosplaying at satanic worship. It wasn't like a, a real, like what an actual Satanist would do, but it was clearly like kind of a pop chic version of that. Um, and needless to say, it, it had they got the attention they ordered uh, and uh, many people did not like it. Yeah. People were predictably up in arms and it was exactly who you think uh, the far right, not even the far right, I would say the middle, like middle right, uh, evangelicals, people sort of in that conservative camp at large really weighed in on this heavily. There was a lot of feedback. I saw one tweet from Liz Wheeler, who's a conservative commentator. She said, don't fight the culture wars, they say. Meanwhile, demons are teaching your kids to worship Satan. I could throw up. And Ted Cruz quote tweeted her and said this is evil and then ben shapiro said but there's something deeper happening here too the elite in our society are fully in line with the ideology of satanic fealty expressed by smith and petrus so they got a little hyperbolic because i saw this and i have to say my knee-jerk reaction to it was like you know when you see those old videos of like ozzy osborne biting a bird's head off or like 
kisses on stage that old rock band they're like sticking their tongues out with blood and it's like supposed to be so horrifying and edgy and you're like this is just weird and creepy yeah. and like, not I, actually like anything close to what an actual satanic ritual would look like it's like it's like you said it's cosplaying and it's just meant to like stir up angst in people and get a reaction and i guess like mission accomplished but i thought it looked really desperate and cheesy and like just lame as a whole yeah i thought it was lame because it's so like you mentioned it's so unoriginal like oh wow you're gonna break out satan no entertainer's ever done that before for attention (laughs) and look i do think the whole performance was kind of gross like i don't i don't really like the fetishization of the devil is not not for me um (laughs) and i'll get into some other angles on it but I did think the the response was panicky and overwrought. Like for I can see why people would not like uh, the devil being sexualized on TV for millions of people. But some of the comments here are just totally blown out of proportion. I mean, nobody is teaching kids to worship Satan in America. Oh, you would find me one kid anywhere who seriously is being taught that. And the idea, and look, I'm no fan of the elite, right? But the idea that, to quote Shapiro, the elite in our society are fully in line with the ideology of satanic fealty. (laughs) No, they're not. No journalists, no media people, no academics, no corporate woke tycoons, politicians, whoever is truly (laughs) pledging their fealty to Satan. And I think that, unfortunately, a lot of people on the right undermine their I think pretty understandable distaste and displeasure with this performance with the sheer hyperbole of their responses. It's like, chill. Well, also, you just give them what they want. Like, this is gimmicky. It's desperate. It's not good entertainment value. It's played out. This is why nobody watches the Grammys anymore. These award shows are increasingly dying out because we're bored. Like, I'm so bored by this. How about just have talent on your stage again? I would love that. But instead of just letting these things die the death they deserve, they continue to drive clicks and views and people talking about it because of their outrage. And it's like you played right into their hands. Nobody would be talking about this award show otherwise because it was very lame and like just not that interesting at all. But you're giving them what they want. So they're going to do more of this in the future. It doesn't really make sense. You always have the ability to simply turn off things you don't like, to look away, to walk away. But the idea that like, this is actually satanic, I think is ridiculous. I'm a pastor's kid. I've seen some satanic things. I actually got taken to a a former witch conference out in Arizona when I was 10 with my dad. Oh, Yeah. He was attending it to learn how to like talk to witches and like help them come out of being witches in the occult. Um, He didn't think I'd be listening. He thought I'd just be like doing my schoolwork and then we were going to see the Grand Canyon after hours. But I was paying attention. I actually talked to some of the witches afterwards. It was fascinating. But like, this is not how they practice Satanism and witchcraft. Like, it's much more, like, sinister, actually, and a little bit less, like, overt. Because the way that they pull people into these, if you're actually in these fringe, you know, practices, and they are very fringe, is not through, like, gyrating in a cage with flames around you. Like, I feel like a lot of parents, their outreach right now, saw that, and they're like, they think little Jimmy's going to be in his room, like, practicing Sam Smith's routine and, like, talking to the devil. It's like, no, they actually usually kind of pull people in more through, like, not Ouija boards, but things like that, right? Like the promise of communicating with loved ones you've lost, the the ability to maybe like have um, some actual like activities you can control in the world. And like, that's more how they pull people in, right? It's not this like weird, I don't know, this just seemed cartoonish as a whole to me. And I, I really do think it's like such an overreaction. And for people like Ben Shapiro to say like the entire elite in this country are just in on worshiping Satan, it's all assault to the devil. Like, Take a chill pill, sir. Take a Xanax. That is not what is happening. <laughs> yeah, you need a Zanny. Um, yeah. That's an interesting perspective, though, about like actual Satanism. I could tell you I've never met or heard or encountered anything of the sort. It's fringe beyond fringe. So um, my one angle on this, though, that I really don't like is I do think uh, that when you are uh, both Kim Petrus and Sim Smith are very prominent celebrities associated with the LGBT community. And I think that when you uh, have that kind of status, uh, you really have an obligation to be mindful of the impact of the, that your public perception will have. And so it might seem weird to people like us who live in, in cities or who have spent time on the coast, but a lot of Americans don't actually know any gay, lesbian, or transgender people in their real life. Yeah. So their nebulous perceptions of the LGBT community are formed basically by what they see in the media, celebrities, entertainment. And you are quite wrongly and quite inaccurately 
intentionally or not, subconsciously telling people <laughs> that like LGBT is the number of comments I've seen that associate Sam Smith's Satan twerking with LGBT at large. Now they shouldn't, that association's not fair, but that's just how people do make associations. And I think you're doing real harm to the cause of LGBT acceptance when you go out there as a gay and, and transgender respectively celebrity and go and literally associate people with anti-Christian values in, in reality, the majority of the LGBT community identifies as religious and Christianity is the most popular religion. And so most LGBT people are not anti-Christian. Almost none of them are Satanists. <laughs> and I feel like Kim Petras and Sam Smith achieved their goals of getting attention, clicks. I'm sure their song is going to perform better now after all this publicity. People want to find out what it's all about. But they did so at the expense of the LGBT community that they say they care about and want to represent. Because if you actually wanted to promote like tolerance and normalization and integration, this is probably the worst possible way to do that. Yeah, I thought you did such an excellent job articulating that point. And I really didn't see anybody else talking about it besides you. You had a couple pieces and, and also some tweets along these lines. And I was I 100 percent agreed with what you were saying, because. I come from those regions of the country where you don't really know people who are gay or transgender, or maybe you do, but they leave when they're 18 and they do not come back, right? So people, you know, my parents, their friends, like these demographics, they probably really don't know people in their intimate circles who are in the LGBTQ community. And so when you have an artist, when you have somebody of note, wear that around on their forehead, right? That is what they lead with is the fact that this is their sexuality. That is the biggest sign on their forehead. And then they do something like this. I think they do it to like thumb their nose at the Christian community. And I want to say, I very much understand that angst that might be there for some people in the LGBTQ community because the church as a whole has treated that community awful, awful. And even though a lot of people who are gay or bisexual, et cetera, do identify with Christianity still, it comes at a cost of having your own churches often preach against you and and devalue your worth. And and I think that I, I do understand like when a group of people, the evangelical movement is who work to keep gay marriage outlawed for decades. I understand why there is some like blowback against that community and maybe like an instinct to thumb your nose at them. And that's probably where Sam Smith and Ken Petras were coming from. But you are absolutely right that in doing that, they do themselves a huge disservice. They do their community a huge disservice because it feeds into a false perception about that demographic that many people in the evangelical movement already hold and that they need to be dissuaded of. So it's very counterintuitive and disappointing to see. I think they actually won the first awards as a transgender uh, and non-binary person last mm -hmm. night. At the Grammys, and that's completely overshadowed by this circus they put on. So, yeah, you also had an interesting take on this from your evangelical background. I saw a tweet and a Facebook post. You got a lot of engagement on Facebook with this one. You wrote uh, in a tweet that I saw, one big issue I've had with my faith as a Christian in America is the evangelical movement's propensity to get bent out of shape over a singer wearing devil horns and twerking versus the true injustices in the world. I don't identify with these people in the least. Now, I don't have insight into this world, but I know this prompted quite the response. Quite the response, quite the interesting and often obtuse response from people in the evangelical community who I've noticed when they come across something like this, their knee-jerk reaction is to get very defensive or even attack the person who's saying something like this with things like, well, you're not a real Christian, or you're just following the gospel of Hannah Cox, or you are making a false parallel here, and it's not either, or you can be equally upset about both. But the, the fact is, you're not equally upset about <laughs> both. I've lived in this community my entire life. I have spent more time in the evangelical movement at its core than the vast majority of people in this country. I know what I'm talking about when I weigh in on this. And this kind of thing, it invokes my childhood to me because I grew up late, late 80s and then the 1990s, which was the height of like the Jesus revolution, the countercultural movement. Um, there was a ton of this like satanic fear mongering in our youth groups and churches at the time. And I was not the only person online that like this kind of recalled that sort of memory for. Um, I saw one person say in my Twitter feed until today, I literally haven't seen people offended by a devil costume since the 1980s. Then maybe a burst of satanic charges against Marilyn Manson in the 90s. Didn't even know it was still a thing. And I agree, this kind of dissipated. But trust you when I say like it was at its peak when I was a kid. And I, I think it made me 
um, I always had issues with Christianity for some of these reasons where I was just, I would look at the adults around me and be like, this is what you're upset about. You're burning Dixie Chick albums in your parking lot and you're worried about somebody wearing devil horns, but like you're not worried about all the people locked up wrongfully in our jails. You're not, you're not out here campaigning against refugees being put in camps at our borders. Like these things that I actually think are at the baseline of what Christians should be concerned about. And that's not according to my own gospel. That's according to the actual Bible and Jesus' teachings. Um, I don't see people up in arms over these things, right? I haven't seen the vast majority of the evangelical movement really upset about the injustices our own government is carrying out right here or through our, our military industrial complex. And when I say I don't see them, I mean, like, I am there. I am at the state capitals. I am at the rallies. I am at the protests. I am in lawmakers offices. I am in the media. I am crusading against these things and they're not there next to me. I'll tell you who I do see next to me. I see a lot of Jewish people next to me. I often see Catholics next to me. I see a lot of um, Amish and Quakers and people who are pacifists next to me. I don't see the evangelical movement showing up and actually getting active in their communities, getting off their butt and doing something to make a difference in the world. Instead, I see them going to church on Sundays and whining on social media about this. And I just think it is such a turnoff to me. It makes me not want to identify as a Christian because, right, that's the label I often have on my forehead. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to be associated with people who think and act like this, like, I don't want that. And Can you people- explain um, one of these tweets I saw says Christians of all people should be the least concerned or fearful of the devil. What does that mean? Yeah, I think that's true. Like if you're actually a Christian, you truly believe in Jesus, you believe in God, then you believe that the devil will be defeated. You believe that that's already done, right? That that will be the final outcome. The devil and and evil and sin has no power over your life. You are free of those chains. Like in my family, we don't fear death. We don't fear like we don't fear bad things happening to us, really, because we we know that God will always work things for good no matter what happens to us. We believe there's life after death. We we don't have the same fears in the world. We don't move in the same way throughout the world as other people do, I think. And and I not to say that like other people of other faiths don't have that same experience or that even people of non faiths don't find that in other sort of like stoic values. But for me, that is what our belief system entails. And so I absolutely agree with that. Like if if you really are a Christian, then like somebody worshiping the devil is not a threat to me. It's not a threat to my religion. It's not a threat to Jesus. It's bigger. We're bigger than that. Like if anything, you want to reach out to them. And I just, when I see these things, I picture like a redone version of the Bible where you have like MAGA Jesus going around and instead of like going and sitting with prostitutes and eating with them, instead of like going and actually like talking to tax collectors and people that were hated in society and who were actually doing evil Rightfully in the world. Rightfully so. <laughs> right. Um, instead, he just goes and like critiques like performances and like, he's like, no, that's not Christian enough for me. Like, it's just such an upside down way of viewing things. And I think it is why the church is dying in this country. And I think instead of getting mad at people like me who are saying, I'm one of you, I come from your community and I am so turned off by you and your behavior that it makes me want to disassociate. And if I feel that way, certainly people who don't even agree with you feel that way. Instead of listening to that and wising up and doing better, they instead attack and attack and attack. But I did see some other good takes along this line. Actually, I saw a surprising take from Allie Vest Stuckley, whose show you went on. Um, she's not in our camp. Like, I feel like no agree with her on much but she she had a great point she said i'm less worried about sam smith's satanic worship service than i am about the far more insidious and effective ways the devil tries to trick people including christians satan is much more influential disguised as an angel of light than he is dancing with horns on stage and like that is on point right if you're actually concerned with evil in the world it doesn't usually come packaged as this like ugly scary box no it comes as something tempting and that looks good and it seems like a good idea for you, but that is entrapping and ruinous in the end. Like that's that's a hundred percent accurate. I love that she said that. Um, I also saw a few other good takes that I really liked. Somebody said, but the real problem is that it's part of the culture war that the conservatives have ignored for decades and lost. Yet something needs to be done about the blatant ease with which media displays these images. It's still important. And I disagree with that. Like you're losing the culture war because you act like this. You're you're losing the culture war because people can't relate to you, right? The way you would actually win the culture war is to step outside of it, to stop fighting people and to offer them a separate pathway, to offer them an alternative way of viewing things and of living in the world and of moving around and of relating to people. 
you're acting just like the people you condemn when you freak out over these kinds of things, right? You you really aren't doing anything that would actually win the culture war. You're just continuing to like get in the mud and wrestle with pigs. I um, thought but- the, um, to, to round this out on the, a lighter note, the funniest comment was, Daily Wire actually worked with <laughs> Sam Smith to choreograph the whole performance to give them something to tweet about. And, yes. you know, not to take shots at Daily Wire specifically, but the whole right wing media complex will get content out of this for days and days and days. So outraged about Satan and the devil and everything. And we're covering it, too, because everyone's it is the top story so far this week, but perhaps not with the same outrage level. Um, and it is just funny to me because these two, this the far left, the unhinged woke extremists and the kind of reactionaries, right? They really are codependent. They really do coexist on each other to justify their own experience and to perpetuate their their own content. And it is uh-huh. kind of funny to to observe that in real action because at the same time that they hate that this is happening, they're also thrilled. They're like, yes, <laughs> here's our coverage for the week. Booked. <laughs> That's right. They need their bad guy out there, you know, otherwise they can't make themselves look good. So I, I thought that tweet was hilarious because this really is just like, a home run for Daily Wire content. Like, they live for this kind of thing. All right. Well, on to another kind of content. AMC movie theaters have made a big splash this week. They just made a big announcement that they will introduce a new three-tiered pricing chart for seats. And people are livid. Uh, They say the three-tiered seating system includes a value sightline, a standard sightline, and a preferred sightline section. And they said that the standard sightline seats are most common in auditoriums and are available for the traditional cost of a ticket. The value sightline seats are primarily in the front row of the auditorium and are available at a lower price. And then preferred sightline seats are typically in the middle of the auditorium and cost slightly more than standard seatline seats so are. Hold so on. they're basically kind of just charging sense. more money for better seats and less money for worse seats. That's that Radical. is literally that is literally it. Um Movie theaters, of course, have been some of the hardest hit over the past couple of years. Production of new films halted, uh, at, I think, for a year or two at the height of the coronavirus. Many of the new releases started moving to like, streaming platforms. So they've been, they haven't even had the content they normally would have to draw people in. They were also one of the types of businesses that were forced to shut down for a period of time. And then even before the pandemic, they were already struggling with their cost model. According to New York Times, Movie going has been on a decline for decades as TV, VHS, and then DVDs and now streaming have allowed people to consume movies in new ways. In fact, the total number of movie admissions in the U.S. had barely budged between 1995 and 2019, whereas the population had increased by 23%. So a new business model does seem to be in order here. Yeah, it's nuts to me that anyone would be outraged by this, but a lot of people are. The actor Elijah Wood tweeted, The movie theater is and always has been a sacred democratic space for all. And this new initiative by AMC would essentially penalize people for lower income and reward for higher income. Uh, Somebody named Jenny Nicholson said, shouldn't filmmakers care that this company is admitting that some seats aren't in optimal view and selling them anyway? Like, it's just a movie. If you're poor, maybe you don't need to see the whole screen. Not to be dramatic. But everyone should boycott AMC. And these are just a few. I mean, uh, NPR correspondent Ian Saint said, I'm thinking about the exhausted low-wage employees who will be tasked with trying to enforce this new tier price seat assignment policy. Others, according to Fox News, blasted this as a perfect example of corporate greed. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? I mean, are these people outraged by concerts or sports games? Better seats cost more money. And it's just hilarious to me. They're acting like this is some outrageous thing. If anything, it was kind of outrageous that they ever charged all the same price for seats of widely varying quality. Because it's not really fair. Uh, And I just, oh my goodness, these people... It's the idea that it's corporate greed to charge appropriate prices depending on quality. Um, no, it, it makes sense. It's good. We should want this. And it won't be hard to enforce. They already have assigned seating in all sorts of movie theaters, right? You just buy your tickets, you pick the seats, and then you sit in the seats. And if somebody's sitting in your seats, you can complain and somebody will uh, tell them to move. I mean, it's so, Hannah, what do you make of all this backlash? 
I mean, the dramatics here are just highly entertaining to me, way better than going to see a movie. I like watching this kind of meltdown on Twitter from people who have absolutely no grasp on reality. I, where to begin? First and foremost, the fact that the little hobbit from Lord of the Rings, Elijah Wood, called <laughs> movie theaters. I'm sorry, hold up. I have to say this clearly. He he called the movie theaters a sacred democratic space. Sir, movie theaters are where people are finger banging in the seat behind you and the floors have sticky like syrup soft drinks all over them. Like, yeah. It's not a sacred space. Okay? You have to like, pay to get in. <laughs> like, the fact that we even go, I've never been big on going to the movies. I think they're high key disgusting. <laughs> they're really gross. The fact that this is his take, like how dare you and take away our democratic space. And you're absolutely right. This is how we've always charged for the vast majority of entertainment venues from the theater to concert venues to sporting. I mean, every single other concept I can think of, you pay for premium seats. And that's not something that hurts the poor. That actually makes it more cost effective for the poor to get in and still get to attend. Where it's like the rich people kind of subsidize. Yeah, maybe they'll sell five dollar tickets now seats. for the for the cheaper seats that aren't as good. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe they can't afford a fifteen dollar movie ticket, but they can afford a five dollar one, and now they'll get to go. That could help poor people. Yeah, exactly. It it doesn't actually wash whatsoever. Um, to call this corporate greed when these companies have literally been like going bottom up for a while now. It's not corporate greed. They're trying to stay afloat against all odds, many of them government-induced odds that they've had to contend with. So I think that that is just another completely detached point of view in this whole situation. The, the fact that they're worried about the low-income workers who have to enforce these policies. Like, what else do they do? <laughs> they literally scan your ticket, give you some popcorn, and make sure you sit in the right seat. Like, I think that's equivalent work for seven fifty an hour. Like, this isn't rocket science. I, in high school, had to work at a grocery store and prevent people from stealing. So, like, I think they can manage they seating They were fine with making these same low-level employees check everyone's vaccine passports. Yeah. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, they can, they can sh- shove that one. Yeah, that's a great point. And like you said, this is already a thing, assigned seating. The only way they got me back in theaters, and I do mean the only way, is they started making it a more luxurious experience. In cities, you now usually have theaters that serve wine and beer. They serve better food besides just like the junk food you used to have in concessions. You can get like actual meals there now. And they have those, you know, comfortable leather lay down seats like recliners. You can take a blankie and it's actually kind of nice. You have a waiter that comes and takes your orders, little screens. What you theaters are you going to, ma'am? These are you the just only described kind. an alien experience to me. No, I bet you don't have them in Grand Rapids. I don't know. How big is Grand Rapids? You might have it's them. A, it's a small, medium city. I mean, but... You might have them. My parents' town is not that big in South Carolina, and their theater got redone. And they, they don't have waiters, but they do have everything else I just said. We um, do go to AMC because they have the luxury recliners. And yeah. uh, those are pretty but nice. Like, and guess those what? Those cost more than normal movie seats. Oh! <gasps> And they're assigned. When you book your tickets, you pick the the seat you're going to be sitting in. It actually makes the whole process easier versus trying to figure out where to sit, getting split up from your party if you get there late. Like, it's just a nicer experience. There's nothing wrong with this. Now, I will say, I think there are better moves that AMC could do to try to draw people back to the theaters because I do think their sales are declining. People increasingly don't want to go to the theater for all the reasons I mentioned when we first started discussing this. And that's valid. But I think if you really want to attract people in, you make it a more luxurious, exclusive experience. And I think, you know, introducing the pricing chart, maybe that adds some of that layer too, right? Like, I don't know, maybe you have like, I'll say this, if you go to a sporting event and you sit in the nosebleed section versus if you sit down on the 50 yard line or even in a box, which I've had the ability to do, the the difference in clientele around you is, is notable because <laughs> It is a different crowd. You're not dealing with the same rowdiness, the same kind of language, people spilling drinks on you. But the stadium is a democratic place for the people. (laughs) (laughs) Like what? (laughs) For the masses. I'm just saying like these are the kinds of things offering people a more luxurious experience. It tends to draw them back in. So there's probably other things they could do as well. But I don't see any problem with this. And again, it likely subsidizes the cheaper tickets for people who can't afford to go. And guess what? If you still can't afford to go, it is not life or death. You can watch a freaking movie on your TV, on your computer, on your phone, and still be better off than the top 1% throughout thousands of years of history. Like, I don't care. I'm so tired of the whining over this kind of thing. Like, not everything makes you oppressed just because you can't access it. 
Yeah, and their new thing is everything I don't like is corporate greed. That's their new yeah. buzzword. They just throw around for any anything they don't like. No eggs in the store, corporate greed. Movie theater tickets changing, corporate greed. My girlfriend broke up with me, corporate <laughs> greed. It's like... No, no, I literally saw a TikTok today of this person saying, why is it so hard to make friends? And I kid you not, they the lady corporate responding greed. to it blamed capitalism and corporate greed. Oh my God. And the nuclear family, and the nuclear family. People are just, was, they'll do I, anything I, except look in the mirror. But yeah. All right. Let's uh, shift gears slightly and talk about a Republican congresswoman who's getting roasted because she's just shilling for big dairy. At issue is Representative Elise Stefanik, who is actually a member of House leadership. And she's a representative from upstate New York. Hint, hint. Upstate New York is big dairy country. Uh, now she's getting roasted because she introduced legislation that would federally mandate that schools across the country that participate in the National School Lunch Program, which includes many private schools as well, be required to sell chocolate and other flavored milk to students. So uh, from the New York Post, upstate New York rep Elise Stefanik is proposing a federal law that would require all schools to offer chocolate or other flavored milk in addition to regular milk in a not-so-subtle jab at health fanatic Mayor Eric Adams, who thinks the sugar-laden dairy product is bad for kids. Now, she tweeted this out, and she said, The fight to save chocolate milk continues. I'm proud to propose a federal law that would require all schools to offer flavored milk. School kids deserve access to nutritious and delicious milk options that our dairy farmers work hard to provide. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like I missed the part of the Constitution where the federal government had any authority over education, um, let alone the ability to require localities to uh, forcibly be forced to sell chocolate milk. The Got Milk campaign sponsored by the federal government is ongoing and well. It never stopped. It just changed formats. And this is the latest iteration. I want to know how many dairy farms are in this woman's district because it's got to be quite a few for this kind of level simping. I, there are a couple groups in politics that like are big no-nos to attack, right? Like you just can't talk about them because they have a lot of money and they're beloved by the American people. And among them are farmers. And I'm, I'm done with the crap. Like there are a lot of great independent small farmers in this country and we are grateful for farmers. But the vast majority of our big ag culture has been seized by seedy um, lobbyists and their associations that work really hard to force absolute crap on you and your kids and to disguise that crap and tell you that it's good for you, which is, again, what this like is. Like chocolate milk. Milk is not good for you, period. Almond milk and, and and other nuts and their milk are much better for you than dairy milk. We know that. And that's why their sales are declining, because as people are becoming more informed, thanks to the internet, um, and as they're starting to recognize some of this information, they're moving away from dairy milk. And that's why you see the milk lobby going hard to try to force sales, because if you make all schools require selling this product, it expires. You know, if kids don't buy it, they don't want it, they already get paid. The dairy farmers get paid on your tax dollars because of that, right? It's the same old thing they did back in the 90s when they literally sponsored the Got Milk campaigns, trying to convince parents that milk made your kids' bones strong. I got like waterboarded with milk as a kid because of this government propaganda. <laughs> literally. Like, well, meanwhile, chocolate milk has as much sugar as a Coca-Cola. Like literally. And we have an obesity crisis and you're trying to mandate this. But the, the real issue is, look, we can debate at the local level whether or not it should be sold in schools, but that's where it should be decided. Uh, and, and people were absolutely roasting Elise Stefanik for this, libertarians in particular. The Libertarian Party of California tweeted, imagine being so small government, you want to force schools to sell chocolate milk to already <laughs> morbidly obese children. Based. <laughs> uh, the Arizona Libertarian Party said, what the nonsense big government F is this? <laughs> uh, and then some guy named Norm DePlume tweeted uh, a, a quote uh, from a fake quote from Elise Stefanik. Proud to be fighting hard to keep the U.S. in the number one spot for global childhood obesity. <laughs> <laughs> and then the classical liberal caucus for the LP said, this doesn't go far enough. Chocolate milk should be mandatory and it should be and it should have extra corn syrup in it to support hardworking American farmers. And all school chairs should be doubled in width. <laughs> doubled in width. That, that does it for me. That is excellent. We'll talk though, why it. do Republicans have to suck so much? Why do they have to have Weird. no actual values or principles? Like she's one of the top Republicans in the House and 
She is just doesn't care about the Constitution whatsoever, uh, apparently, and doesn't really believe in free markets whatsoever. Is just you know shilling this for the is, interests of her home state industry. I mean, this is yeah. just this is so this, so depressing to me. This is why people are always like, you go after Republicans so much harder than Democrats. I'm like, yeah. Because Democrats at least tell you what they are, right? Like, they openly suck. They're not trying to disguise it. Like, they're socialist commies, and and that's what they are. So I expect them to suck. Republicans are over here claiming to espouse my values, which are actually free market capitalism, actually limited government, actually individual liberty, and then doing the exact opposite. And by doing that, they confuse people who don't understand the difference. And because of all of the bad side effects of their bad ideas that are actually counterintuitive to free markets and limited government and individual liberty, people blame those things for their bad ideas because they think they're practicing those things. And that's why, like, I cannot stand these people. Like, get off my plot. Go call yourself something else. Call yourself shills. Call yourself sellout. I don't care what you have to make up, but like, this ain't it. This is literally just cronyism, corporatism. It's 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 an active in- attack on the nutrition of our kids. I mean, it's, it's just so sinister as a whole. And I really can't, I mean, both sides are complicit in this. Big Ag has been waging a war on the American people for over a century now. And it's working. We are dying of obesity. We are dying of heart disease. We are dying of diabetes. These are the number one killers in this country. And it does trace back to our food and to our nutrition. And the number of ways that they do this, I cannot even begin to list for you. This is the tip of the iceberg. But trust me, if you keep digging, you will find more and more and more of this. And all of a sudden, it will start to make sense why Americans are so overweight and so unhealthy. I think we're just not drinking enough chocolate milk to be healthy. That's what we got to do. Start guzzling that and you'll just get fit. You'll just be ripped in no time. No, I I, I kid, but my God, what a disappointment. Mm. All right. Well, speaking of another disappointment, we saw a hilarious video on Twitter. We want to move into a quick hit segment real fast. The first one is this video of people who were trapped in my living nightmare recently. They were trapped on an airplane uh, that didn't take off as scheduled. And how many hours were they there, Brad? It was it was a while. So these people got stranded on their plane in Iceland for 10 hours due to 115 uh, km winds. And this group posted and said, luckily we had our instruments on the plane and decided to start a sing-along. Take a listen. Virginia. So I don't know about you, but for me, this is a terrorism. This is actually like like a crime on the community. If I was on that plane, I would have been just livid. Well, for me, this was my entire college experience because I went to Belmont University, which is a music school where everybody thinks you want to hear their demo, you want to hear them sing, and there's just random people bursting out in song literally all over the place well, at least then you, you can leave it. you're not trapped by not sealed you know, sealed you're, doors <laughs> you're trapped on the campus but yeah i mean this this is literally it reminds me of that though because these people always assume you want to hear them sing meanwhile like they no just, one is singing along she goes one more time and everyone's like christ no <laughs> <laughs> we have to read the comments we have to read the comments <laughs> okay first up Someone said, Bo should use this footage completely unedited as a commercial for their noise-canceling headphones. What is the price of sanity, you ask? $300. Come and get them. Take my money. Take it. Now, this <laughs> one is a little messed up, and it, we only mean it as a joke, but Aaron tweeted, if I was on this flight, I'd be praying for George Bush to do his thing. Oh, my God. Somebody else <laughs> said, the way no one is singing along. <laughs> It literally, they're like, let's do a sing along. And it's just this There's whole, like, like, stoic face, like, the cold lady in the mask audience. The lady in the mask behind them is like, how do I suffocate myself with this mask? <laughs> yeah, somebody else tweeted, throw me into a running jet engine, please. 
Uh, and oh another person God. wrote, this would cause me to end up on the no-fly list. And I, I'm just going to say, honestly, same, same. Yeah, it is kind of crazy that when this sort of thing happens, you can't just opt to get off the plane. Like, if you were to tell me you're going to be stuck on a plane for 10 hours, I'd be like, I'll pay you $1,000 to get off this flight and book another one. Like, just let me off. But you don't have that option. Like, they will not let you leave. Yeah, I've had it on a, a plane before where my connecting flight gets canceled and I'm on this flight to somewhere there no longer makes sense. And I'm like, crap, can I get off? And once they close that door, they will not let you off. Uh, and I, I don't like that feeling of being trapped in a steel cage and I especially don't like it if there's literal musical terrorists on board. No, I think I'd take a baby crying over that. Oh, like, I would absolutely. I, I baby crying. My AirPods Pro can can cancel out. I was next to a baby recently, and the AirPods Pro did maybe seventy five percent canceled it out. But with yeah. that kind of music and uh, th- that would be hard. Yeah, that would be awful. This is not good tourism advertising for Iceland. <laughs> no, I'm like, watch me, catch me never, ever, if that's how the people think they're, think it's okay to behave. <laughs> also, just if you can get trapped on a tarmac for 10 hours because of wind, like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> no, thank you. All right. Well, speaking of other things that are torturous, I recently came across yet another anti-capitalist TikTok. TikTok promotes the heck out of these kinds of things because they have an agenda. Shocker. And so I have a plethora of bad content that I just say um, that I don't really know what to do with. So I think I want to share it with you guys <laughs> and help you um, laugh it with Spread me. Spread the suffering around. Yeah, but also I just kind of want to dissect it because this one video, which is, I mean, we won't play the whole thing. We'll do a couple of clips. It's about two minutes long. It has numerous people weighing in and just whining about their their plight under capitalism. And there's so many bad takes under it that I we just have to break it down. So I want to play this first clip to get us started. I don't want to do anything to make money. I don't want to. I just find it so terrible that at the young age of 23, I'm ready to check out. Like, I don't want to do anything at all. I don't want to work because my money's not mine. I don't want to go to school because I feel like I'm getting a degree for somebody else. Like, I don't want to do anything. And I feel like that's so sad. Having my regular meltdown and realizing I'm never going to escape capitalism. And I'm just going to be a cog in the machine of productivity for my whole life so i can't escape capitalism ma'am yes you can board a flight today to literally into venezuela be my guest i will pay for you hit me up i will pay for you a one-way ticket to russia china uh, north korea cuba. venezuela cuba any of these wonderful anti-capitalist paradises that you want to go to because you find the idea of being productive so mortifying you can escape capitalism. Now, it is true that uh, people come on rafts and risk drowning or being eaten by sharks to try to get from there to capitalism here in America. Um, but you can go the other way. We won't. You don't even have to take a raft. We'll actually get you on a boat or a plane. You may escape capitalism. You know, we're a nonprofit based. And I think one thing we should start fundraising for, Brad, is a fund where we will buy people like this a one-way ticket to a communist country. But the deal is they have to live there for five years can't come back cannot come back i think that'd be a great use of our money (laughs) as a whole like please ship these people off i mean this is stupid like i cannot begin one to just put myself in the shoes of being this weak-minded i'm sorry i just i i know like i have a lot more um to me than a lot of people but like get over it good god like the amount of suffering and just like banalness that has been the vast majority of human history and you live in the richest country of all time you have more opportunities than the vast majority of people will ever see and you're gonna sit here and whine and cry about it because you can't handle it like i cannot fathom that being like that excuse for i just don't want to do anything then you should starve like literally if you're unwilling to work like and this makes me may sound cold or extreme but i do believe in like a basic safety net for people who are genuinely disabled or single mothers with a ton of kids but if you're just lazy and you're an able-bodied adult and you don't want to work there should be nothing for you no food no health care nothing you should either well, have to produce yeah. and be productive in society or you can starve as far as i'm yes, concerned because what they're actually saying is she wants me to wait on her she wants me to give her everything right she thinks she's force. So idled and so wonderful that she should get sit on her ass and have people bring her everything she needs to survive you don't want to be productive you don't want to work you don't want to create value in the world but you want everybody else to do it for you and then hand it to you like get over yourself i just 
these kind of people have been so coddled that I think their brain development stunted somewhere along the way. I cannot have a bit of sympathy for them. And it's almost just like, I don't know, I really do wish you could make them swap places with people who are desperate for opportunity, for people who would come on a raft just to go over here for the chance to work. I would love to have a program. There's so many immigrants I would trade them for. Yes. In a heartbeat. (laughs) Like, please, can we have an exchange program? Please. Um, But there's more. Up next. Oh, uh, yeah. It actually gets worse. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So up next, we've got a clip about how my job doesn't care about me as a person. Take a listen and and keep in mind that this had literally millions of likes. This is from a man, too. It just makes it so much worse for some reason. Waiting that this generation doesn't want to work. The reality is many of us that are in my age or a little older, a little younger, are working jobs that do not care about us as people. And I'm going to say that again because I think that's a very, very important distinction that a lot of people are forgetting. I am not going to fucking kill myself over a job that doesn't care about me as a human being. I am not going to put in a 60 hour work week and pull myself up by my bootstraps for a job that does not care about me as a person. The most deluded part of that is the comment where it says hunter gatherers only worked 20 hours a week. Man, (laughs) what are you talking about? They also were like, he died from exposure or dysentery and like lived in caves. So (laughs) that's the only time they could leave their cave for safety reasons. (laughs) No, I like this whole video. The actual tagline of it, I forgot to include, says, quote, quote, life isn't supposed to be like this. Yeah, people, you're right. These people it's could live in the most be. prosperous and free time in global human history and constantly act like things have just never been worse. They're crazy. It's like, yeah, actually, life was this hard and much harder for the vast majority of people. Like, you have it very easy. And the fact you don't know that is ridiculous. But I'm sorry, hearing this man, this beta man sit here and whine about having to work for a company that doesn't care about him who he is as a person. What? Like, I'm, get out of here. Who cares? The work isn't supposed to care about you. Work isn't supposed to meet your emotional needs. You go, you provide That's what a service. Therapy is for, you sir. create value, you make money, you support yourself and your family, and then, like, go to therapy. Like, go figure out your deep void inside of you and why you need to be loved and taken care of and nurtured by everybody around you. I think this is weird. I've worked for companies and I had some great, you know, colleagues I worked with when I did this. So I don't want to like throw them under the bus, but I worked for a company that was left wing at one point and they were all about this, like your company caring about you. And I was like, I don't need my company to care about me. I have parents that love me. I have siblings. I have romantic relationships. I have friends. I have community. I have churches. I have mentors. Like I don't need my job to care about me and be all up in my business. Like I would prefer you not. <laughs> like my job under- is, is how I take care of my family. And that's what motivates yeah. me and how I establish a life for myself and make an impact in the world. It's not my emotional support blanket. That's what no. my dog is for. Right. And they act like that all of a sudden under capitalism, companies don't care about you as if like, the government does. Yeah. In a socialist system, the government really cares about you. Or, or even pre-capitalism, like your fealty lords cared about you and really <laughs> cared about your well-being. The lords really had your best interest at heart. <laughs> What are you talking? Like, what are you smoking? Probably I just I think good. this is bonkers. Yeah, share. <laughs> Since you're such a collectivist, share your weed. Y'all, I've had a series of fucking panic attacks at fucking work today. Like, we are not supposed to live like this, y'all. Brad, you and I both have been very open about having anxiety issues. I have a generalized anxiety disorder diagnosed with it. You also have anxiety. We've talked about this. I have sympathy for people having panic attacks because, one, they are outside of your control. Two, that is the problem with the anxiety disorder is that you often overreact to things that you should not be anxious about, right? People get this confused. It, there's normal anxiety where you're responding to a situation that is anxiety inducing. And then there is uh, anxiety disorder or panic attacks where you're having a disproportionate reaction to something. So I'll caveat that with what he says here. Maybe he's in that category, but I don't know. Just given the overall compilation of this video, it seems to be people who are in absolute histrionics over having to do the basic minimums to take care of themselves and provide for themselves as humans in the world. Like, if you are having panic attacks about having to do basic amounts of work to take care of yourself, that's a mental health issue that you need to go take care of, right? I'm sympathetic to mental health issues, but I'm not sympathetic to the fact that you get to bleed all over society because you don't heal your wounds. It's your responsibility to take care of that. And it should not be sending you into hysterics that you have to go to work, even having to go to work to to a job you hate, which I've done many times in my past, right? I've had to work for bosses. I've had to work in situations that in hindsight, I would call like employment abuse. I didn't know enough at the time to know it wasn't okay what was happening. But like, I've been in some of those situations. They suck. 
keep going, move on, find another job. Like it, it's, I get it, but this this shouldn't be your normal reaction to work because the reality is you work less now than most people ever have in history. You work in better conditions than most people ever have in history. Like when I see somebody like this, I'm like, this is probably an office worker sitting there crying and whining about how hard it is and stressful it is to go to their job. And I think about my grandfather, you know, two generations back in Alabama had an eighth grade education and worked every day in a pipe factory where he actually was in danger. He actually was coming home covered in suit. He would be so dirty when he got home at the end of the day that I wasn't allowed to like hug him. He would have to like stand outside, take off all his clothes. My grandmother would put newspapers down. He'd walk from the porch into the bathroom and get in the shower. And I would, I would have to like go in my room and then I could come out and see him after he got out of the shower and was clean. Wow. Like, kind of job would send me into a panic attack probably but like that's not what you're doing baby that's not even we're close to what you're doing there's kids digging through trash in india right now like get over it yeah <laughs> fair enough all right last clip we do not want to spend any more of our time selling stuff to people we want to spend our time on something that feels good for the collective i want to help people so does this person not realize that no one is forcing you to become a salesperson and that you can literally work for a nonprofit, work for the government, if you think that's helping people, you can work for a charity, you can volunteer, like no one's stopping you from helping people with your intuitive gifts is what she <laughs> writes in the caption. Um, but <laughs> something that feels good for the collective. Now that's where you just, you're, you sound a little creepy there. There is no collective that doesn't have feelings or a consciousness. You should maybe try to help some individuals, but you know what, what a great way to do that? Work, make some money, and donate it to causes in need. These kind of people always crack me up because they have such a like fantastical idea of what their lives would be like under communism or socialism or any other economic system, right? They never picture themselves as the people out like toiling in the fields, gathering the food. They always see themselves as like, I'm going to be the neighborhood poet who just blows people away with my poetry. And it's only capitalism that's preventing me from doing that right now. Like, no, your lack of talent is preventing you from doing that. And you wouldn't get to do it under socialism or communism either. You'd have actually You'd less opportunity. You'd all day waiting on the bread line. Like, sweetie, you're at, if you're at the bottom of the totem pole in capitalism because you don't have enough grit and talent and determination and a work ethic to, like, make it and succeed, you're not going to get the cushy spots in communism or socialism either. I don't know how to explain this to you. Like, that's not how it ever works. The people who get those top spots are the most power hungry at the top and, and ready to, like, seize power and take your money there, too. So, like, they're just delusional about what their lives would look like in another system. They're delusional about why their lives look like how they look right now. Like, you are your own problem. If you want to help people number one selling people things they need helps people providing things for people that increase their quality of life helps people capitalism helps people as a whole and then under that system if you want to do something charitable like you said make money and donate it volunteer your time or if you really want to go work in social work go work at a church go work at a nonprofit. go do whatever you want to do as an activist if you're good at it you can find a way to get paid to do it like this isn't rocket science so i just i have no patience for these people whatsoever and i, I don't understand how you get to a place in your life where you're crying on tiktok like this yeah i mean and this has 5 million views 1.2 million likes this is intellectual poison that's being spoon-fed by the chinese communist party's app to American generations of youth, I think um, intentionally to to yeah. leave us weakened and uh, to break down our competitive advantage among the next generation. And so that's why I think it's so important that we push back on stuff like this. A thousand percent agreed. All right, mailbag time. What do we have up first? So we got an email in from Stephen that says, Aloha, Brad and Hannah. What is the Liberty Movement's position on Native Americans? I live in a part of California that has a very large native population, and there's a large portion of the community that wants to give all the land back to natives. I know the liberty movement is big on property rights and is anti-theft. I feel like this road leads to giving back the land to the natives. Would you be in favor of this? What is the liberty movement's position on Native Americans? This is a tricky one. I, I can't say I have all the answers. I think it was definitely wrong to take land uh, from Native Americans way back when. Um, although they didn't have exactly a sense of this land is owned by this person in most cases, so it's not really um, traditionally comparable to property rights as we would have imagined them. Um, and certainly much of the land was not in use by Native Americans. Um, but 
I, I, I think kind of like with reparations, I think this idea of giving it back hundreds of years later to people who never owned it and who were never involved in any of this and are just descended generations and generations down doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, and, and unfairly would take away land today from people who have done nothing wrong. I don't know. I, I, yeah, it's a real tricky one. What to do with tribal communities and Native Americans? I, I don't. I don't think I have a good answer. Yeah, I mean, it's not something I've thought deeply about. So I, I try not to spout off on things until I've done due diligence and research and contemplation on them. I also really dislike when people ask me like what the Liberty Movement or Libertarian Party stances on things because I, I don't think there's one piece of. Yeah, I only speak for me. Anything. Like I speak for myself. I'm not a member of the LP. I never have been. Probably never will be. So like. I don't know what the official position is or if they even have one. I think for me, um, I am a strong believer in property rights. I don't really think, though, that when it comes to like the division of countries and how they were seized and who's in power, like you cannot go back. It's the same thing as like reparations. Like maybe we were talking like 50 years, you know, post the American Revolution and you could actually figure out who was kicked off their land, et cetera, and actually sort of do that, then it would make sense. But we're so far down the line now, it doesn't make sense. Nobody alive was involved in any of that. Lands have always been seized and sold and taken. And like that's just a part of history. And and maybe it's messy and maybe it's unjust, but I don't think you can go back and right the wrongs of of government justices. Like that's just too vast of thing to do. I think instead, again, you have to work at limiting the government now, limiting its power now. I do think that the government should sell off the vast majority of the lands that it owns. I think the U.S. government owns far too much land um, throughout the the state. So I'd be in favor of that. Not in favor of just like giving land to people or starting to dice things up, though, as a Maybe whole. Maybe it can sell some to some tribes. Who yeah. Knows? I mean, if you want to sell them, I think that's fine. Sell them at a reduced rate even. Like, that's fine. But I, yeah, I don't really, I'm not into the whole reparation thing for money or land. I just, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Up next, another commenter said, Brad Palumbo, hey, I know it's very YouTube-ish, but I would love to one day hear the story of how you met your BF, LOL. As a fellow Gen Z gay, center-right politically, it's brutal to find love. Aw, LOL. Anyway, no pressure, and I respect your privacy, too. Love ya. Aw, that's sweet. That's sweet. I, um, I, I feel the struggle. It was very hard dating. I was very unpopular in the DC gay community. Honestly, we just met online on a, on a dating app. We lived close to each other, so we were um, presented to each other, and then we met. And he actually assumed that I was a lib at first, because I said I was a journalist, so he assumed I was a liberal. Then it kind of came out in our conversation that neither of us were really like that, and then we kind of just clicked in a lot of ways. So I, I guess I don't have a lot. I went on a lot of first dates, is all I'll say. I probably went on Maybe it, my first two years living in D.C., I probably went on at least 50 first dates. Uh, and then uh, that one uh, clicked and everything's gone from there. Um, so I guess I would just my only advice would be don't be discouraged. Also, I would recommend and this is hypocritical. It's not what I did. But meeting people in person whenever you can is generally better um, uh, because they're less likely to just write you off immediately because of your beliefs. If it's in person versus just swiping on some profile. Uh, but yeah, just stick it out. There's a lot more people in uh, kind of in the same camp as us than you'd think. And so you'll probably meet one of them one of these days. And if you're in a bad area, move. <laughs> that's really, that really is my advice for a lot of single people, though, that say like they're having a hard time where they're at. I'm like, it might be where you live. Change it up. Move. You're young. Fill it out. Um, all right. Rachel says, Brad, just curious, what does the white plaque or canvas behind you say? So it is a Milton Friedman quote that said there is there. Um, it, oh, what's the exact quote? There's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. And I think it is the quote that best sums up the issues facing this country in the last few years. Uh, and Milton Friedman is kind of my intellectual uh, hero. So that's why I have that quote on display. Mm. Oh, she also wanted to know what books you have on the shelf behind you. So behind me on the bookshelf, I have Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, which is, I think, the best Econ 101 generic level book that you can get to understand the economy from a free market perspective and is also accessible that you don't have to be a student of economics to read it. Um, I also have uh, Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, which, again, is kind of my ideological um, lo like lodestar. And then I have my friend Stephen Kent's book, uh, which is the Force Can Fix the World, uh, which is a really interesting connection of Star Wars to politics, uh, to communities, and more, which I enjoyed. And he's my friend, so people should check out his book. 
Yeah, we love Stephen. As far as merchandise ideas, how about something anti-war or even anti-draft or conscription? Um, I, 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 it might be a little niche to do something like draft or conscription because it's not really a thing at the moment. But something anti-war, I'm sure, will be a part of our, our expanded line if we ever do. Let's see here. Tyron Rollercoaster said, Brad Palumbo is doing a podcast. Welcome to the first podcast for the right I have listened to all the way to the end. That's nice. I'll take it, I guess. Probably a gay simp, to be honest. There's a there's a good number of gay Democrats. Remember when we read comments from gay Democrats who just uh, just thirst for me? And so they just tolerate my content, even though they don't <laughs> like it. Yeah, that was really entertaining for me. I, like, I got asked recently like what your audience was like. And I was like, I think it's a lot of gay simps. And I think he has more conservatives that I have more like moderate to leftist. But I'm not a ton. I'm not totally sure. But yeah, that was kind of my read. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, up next, Bernie bros always claim that Bernie is an international moderate, but Bernie's policies are farther left than the status quo of every single first world nation on every major issue except guns. I hope Bernie shares the profits of the book tour with the venue workers and printing <laughs> press workers that created the wealth. I agree. I think we Ooh. should redistribute that wealth. Uh, to the people and the workers. And also, it is a good point because even the countries that people like Bernie and AOC point to, like Denmark, for example, are actually much more capitalist and free market in their economic structures than their plans are, yet they point to their successes and say, look, that's what my agenda could lead to. Not really, but... <laughs> yeah, no, your policies look like Venezuela and Cuba. They never point to the places their true policies are in play because they're terrifying. They point to Actually, places. Actually, it's really crazy. There's a very prominent um, Bernie Sanders advisor who wrote an article just a year or two before Venezuela's collapse about like the golden miracle of Venezuela's system and was like lauding it as a, a, a I think it's David Sirota, but I'm not sure. One of Bernie's top advisors. Um, and, and literally then just a year or two later, Venezuela totally imploded. And I'm like, yeah. Who could have seen it coming? <laughs> literally everybody except for commies. Uh, Rolling Tree said, excellent analysis on Tyree Nichols, recognizing the kernels of truth and the significant faults in the more typical, overly simplistic, shallow, extreme perspectives. I agree. Um, and then Johnny says, this will not lessen until qualified immunity goes out the window. It's systemic and cultural the way the police behave. They do it because they have a union and PD cover up these acts when they can. I think there's truth to that, but I, I would actually maybe push back a little and say that with something like the murder of Tyree Nichols, qualified immunity not existing wouldn't have changed to that. Like they still would have done that. They knew they were on camera and they knew they were just killing someone like. But if you knew you could be personally sued for damages. But they for know that. they could be criminally charged with murder and that didn't stop them. Fair. But I do think this overall point is right. Like this yes. is a cool. I think in police general, team. police would be less likely to abuse if they were responsible. I think in the most extreme cases like this, where they're literally killing someone on camera, they probably already know that a lot of bad things could happen to them if they get caught. They don't think they will though, because they typically don't. And like I think that's what it comes down to is like you're like, well, they were committing murder on camera. And it's like, yeah, but they do that a lot and they get away <laughs> with it. And it's the same as true in the general population. The best deterrent to criminality is the assurance that you'll be caught and punished. Period. And police as a whole know the odds are very much in their favor that they won't face punishment criminally or civilly. And so I think until that actual structure changes, nothing about police really changes more broadly. All right. We've got hot takes up last. What do you have this week, Brad? So my hot take is that old dogs are better than puppies. They just are. Um, and I know I have so many friends, including you, who get, who've gotten puppies and it just sounds terrible. Uh, yes. it's so much they always tell me it's more work than they thought or oh my goodness it's like having a baby it's it's like very frustrating it's it dominates their life meanwhile you and also it costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars meanwhile you can rescue an old dog for very little money and they will be low energy they'll just be relaxed they'll be super chill in many cases i just generally think old dogs are better than puppies you're not wrong. I actually looked into adopting a Samoyed before I got Phoenix, but I really wanted a Samoyed and Chocker. There were none up for adoption because these are really sought after dogs and hard to get a hold of, period. Um, but also, I will say this. I took the death of my Yorkie, uh, which is about four years ago, worse than almost anything that's ever happened to me. I had him for almost 14 years and it laid me out when he died. And so that was my other incentive in getting a puppy is I'm just like, I want him to live as long as possible. I want as many days as I can possibly have with them. I already cry when I think about Phoenix dying one day because I'm a psychopath, but like 
But I will say everything you just said about puppies is right. I feel like I have a newborn baby. I feel like I don't wash my hair as much as I used to. I'm tired. I am in constant training mode. It's constant. To, to raise a good dog is a lot of work. You really have to be strict with them and keep the constant training going. And Phoenix is a very good puppy compared to, compared to most people. Everybody says that. The dog trainers, people in public, people are like, wow, I cannot believe how good he is for four months. But do you know what he did while I was skiing? He went skiing. He was at the Airbnb. I have this little blink camera that I got off Amazon where I can spy on him while I'm gone. Again, because I'm a psychopath. And I can actually talk to him through it. And he did great for like eight hours. But at the eight hour mark, I observed this dog get on the bed and take a giant dump on the bed. And I'm screaming on the ski lobes. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, Phoenix, no, get off the bed. He showed you. He got me good. Like, so yeah, um, I, I do look forward to him being a little bit more mature. That's for sure. Uh, anyways, okay. My hot take is that it is perfectly acceptable to pop peppermints and other hard candy like over and over and over. Every time I have a driver come get me to like go to the studio to do a, a TV hit or like I'm in an Uber and they have candies in the door, I used to feel kind of guilty about this because I will just eat like 10 in a row. But I don't feel guilty anymore. And now I just let myself have as many as I want because listen, like it's tempting and they're good. And I think it's totally okay to consume them like that. Yeah. Also, I think they would rather you have a good breath then breathe on them and be gross. That's exactly right. All right, guys. Well, that's a wrap. Once again, be sure to leave us a review. Leave us a comment. We'll read it on the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next week, stay based.